So this morning um, we spoke about oxy fuel combustion, but uh, more specifically about oxy fuel combustion in PF fired boilers. Right. Now we are moving on to ox um, CFBC, circulating fluidized bed combustion, and uh, oxy fuel in that one. So that's the only difference. So there are a lot of similarities, but uh, let's see what the differences are. So we spoke about this bit in the morning. Now we are talking about that oxygen combustion. Okay. Um, the content is um, a little bit uh, to bring you back to the coal-fired power generation, the status of it, but more specifically with respect to um, CFBC and um, the current status and advantages, and then more specifically the Oxy CFB, and um, then um, uh, we will um, have our share of comments summarize everything that we hear. Now, this is um, something that um, you have seen, a variation of it, that the total global coal-fired uh, power generation capacity was about, um, two, is about 2015 gigawatt electrical um, in 2019. And uh, four years ago, sorry, nine years ago, it was about 4,400 gigawatt electrical uh, less. So all of those um, changes have taken place predominantly in China and India. Then if we look at the right side um, chart, there's the regional distribution. Uh, again, that figure is um, for 2010. I don't have the total break up, uh, breakdown for region-wise. Therefore, I haven't given the 2010, uh, 2019 one. So, but um, then bringing back to uh, the CFB, uh, if you look, um, out of 1650 gigawatt at the end of 2010, and the 46.5 gigawatt was CFBC. So these are all air-fired CFBC, not oxy. And at the end of 2018, out of 2015 gigawatt electric electrical, it's about 55. And to put matters into context, at the end of 2004, it was 17 gigawatt. So you can see how this capacity has grown and um, keeping in mind that the, um, the, the advantage of the CFBC is that it can burn all sorts of fuels, solid fuels, anthracite to lignite to biomass to petroleum coke, and of course liquid fuel as well. So that's one advantage of the CFBC. But um, what I haven't given in here, the largest uh, size uh, of a single unit, which is about 600 megawatt, place, a place called Baima in China. Um, their indigenous design. Um, but before that, there are a number of Foster Wheeler designed units uh, have been built, commissioned, and been operating. Um, there is a there is an understanding that CFBCs can burn whole all the different varieties of fuel. So people have tried so many different varieties in existing power stations that some of the units have actually uh, been um, made to face problems because of tremendous variation in the feedstock. So in as much as everything 
that you, uh, you think can be burned by the CFBCs, nevertheless there is a need for having some kind of sorting rather than throwing the kitchen sink into a CFBC which simply um, doesn't tolerate it. So there is still a need for quality control of the fuel that goes. Uh, instead of biomass, if you start putting brown coal or lignite, that's fine. Or instead of that, if you start putting pet cork, it's fine too. But if you start putting in all sorts of metallic um, residues uh, into the CFBC, then, then that's what starts problem. And I have literally seen CFBC um, where the distributors have been um, blocked with uh, fork, uh, the fork that we use for uh, eating, those sort of things. Or be simply because people, some people think any um, uh, municipal solid waste, you can chuck it in and then it will burn. No, it doesn't. So Professor Shaha spoke about CFBC fundamentals the other day. So you must um, uh, have realized from there how the bed actually behaves and um, how the circulation is established because it's the establishment of the circulation and maintenance of the circulation is really the key for satisfactory operation of a CFBC. Otherwise you will start getting um, in, uh, inadequate performance from a circulating fluidized bed combustor. Now, CFBs in the morning, I did mention that the scaling CFBs have been happening gradually over uh, decades as more and more experience come on hand. Uh, because the uh, theory for solid-solid interactions, um, gas-solid interactions are not all that developed that will allow you to uh, fully um, and confidently uh, scale up from one size to the other. Usually in the PFR units, uh, people say that 1 is to 20, 1 is to 50 is scalable. That's all based on available theories um, and the available experience. But uh, for CFBCs, CFBs, we are still not there yet. Um, that's why CFBs haven't gone past uh, 600 megawatt yet, even though I know that Foster Wheeler has a design for 800 megawatt electrical. But to my knowledge, uh, such a unit has not yet been uh, built. Someone has to take the risk to build it. Um, uh, I mean, pay for it, get it built, and then commission and operate. Uh, operate. But now, so what is CFB combustion? This is a very simplified um, schematic that I show to my students. That on the left side you have the riser. On the right side, you have a big cyclone integrated. And then uh, underneath the cyclone, you have the external heat exchanger. And then there is a kind of a loop seal, which then brings the solid back here again. And um, here, the air and the fuel and if required, the sorbents for sulfur capture, etc., or for agglomeration control. These are fed here. Primary air also goes here. Secondary air is given, stiffer staged air is given to control the NOx at the higher level. Secondary air in a CFB also serves a, a very important purpose of keeping the circulation going. So in as much as the circulation is provided by the primary air, but depending on the height of the um, riser, 
secondary or even tertiary level air is introduced to give a push to the incoming bed materials and the um, solids, the entire solids, uh, a push towards the uh, upper end so that it goes to, through the, cy uh, through the um, cyclone. Now, this is a combustor. This is not a ga gasifier, so you can have bed material. So, so here, the reactivity, combustion reactivity has a different meaning. Combustion is obviously faster. And I was going to come to this. The particle sizes here are much larger than NPF. How much? Hmm? Why six? Could be uh, six, eight, ten, twenty. Not a problem. So, so what will happen is, uh, if if the particle size is too large, then what will happen? It will fluidize. It will be bubbling, uh, fluidized in the bubbling mode. It will stay in the bed until such time it can get reduced to a size that is illutriable, that is consistent with the size at for which the bed has been designed, the circulating bed has been designed. Okay. So the point I'm making is that if the design particle size is, mean design particle size is 6 millimeter as you were saying, if all on a sudden uh, the particles come in at one millimeter size, then what will happen? They will, they will simply illustrate. And during the illustration process, combustion is fast. They will, they will get combusted to the extent that is possible by them. But if you all on a sudden, if you buy, get swarmed with a huge bunch of particles, 50 millimeter, for example, happens, um, then that will not be all lost because that will then simply sit here and bubble, um, be fluidized in the bubbling mode because the particle size is much higher. Uh, and if you can recall, Professor Shah has showed that the fluidization velocity is a function of particle size density of the gas which is connected to the temperature and um, what else and the density of the particles. So um, and when the particle then uh, gradually shrinks and this is a case where shrinking core model definitely your favorite shrinking core model can definitely be applied. Uh, so when it comes to a size then it will start circulating. Even in the bubbling bed, they will be combusting because it is coming in contact with um, the hot solids all the time. And you know, um, hot solids uh, have huge thermal capacity, specific heat. Um, uh, you, you know, when they, they sell the um, roasted um, corn on the roadside, uh, they roast it on uh, hot, yeah, and underneath there is the, uh, the uh, char, hot char is providing heat to the stone, and on the stone is uh, all your, so just the ash and the bed materials are like um, huge thermal capacity, so they are uh, keeping the storing the heat.
Okay. So. Correct. It it changes from uh, coal to char to um, ash, and then when it comes to a very um, very close to the cyclone's cutoff size, it then vanishes through the cyclone. Correct. So the cyclone design is very, very important that it does not allow the unborn char particles to go through. I haven't shown the subsequent sections in the rig. I'm just concentrating on that. It only allows to go uh, the uh, allows only the ash particles to go or predominant ash particles to go. But the fact is that in a CFB at any point of time of all the solids how much is char and how much is bed material what proportion of the solids in the bed are actually char and what is bed material huh? 20-30% is char So, so 4, 5, 10, so 4, 5, 20, 20 30. No. <laughs> so I'm getting all the numbers. So, so yeah, I think 5% is the good approximation. At any point of time, the bed inventory is huge. About 95% of the bed inventory is um, uh, inert solids whether that is bed material added or the ash that have been agglomerating. And only 5% is the incoming, the uh, char generated from the incoming feed. The inventory is 20 times. One is to 19. I can say that every second there is a certain program of feed. Circulating. And the inventory is circulating. No, part of the inventory is circulating. So roughly about 40% of the inventory is circulating. Because what will happen? What happens is the students are going to the lab to see your fluidization. This has to go, and you can see you have more dense, denser bed here, then it is leaner, 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 and then it, it here it starts to become denser. And then if you have designed it correctly, there is a void space, and then here it drops. When the level goes up to a certain point, then with the help of this aeration air, it is pushed up so that it falls here for this particular design of the loop seal so that nothing can go from here to here only way it can go from here it can come here after falling down from the cyclone and the down comma here and then it go So usually, the bed materials, which are consisting of ash and sand or whatever, ash is continuously uh, escaping and then replenished from the coal. So that's not a problem. But the sand also, because it goes round and round and round, it undergoes attrition. So it can also get lost. So usually there is a rule of thumb um, uh, experience available that you will be adding one to three percent makeup. 
and how we do it through the feeding system. Okay. And then, this is the most important bit that um, constantly the screw uh, extraction system provides the seal so that no amount of air from outside can go that way. It is designed in that manner and the slopes, etc. And that uh, the periodically you will have to extract the bed material. Otherwise, if the bed gets built up with agglomerated sand, then beyond a certain point you will have problems. So, maintaining the bed level, particularly the bottom of the bed level through proper extraction and then replenishing that through the feeding system is extremely important. Okay. So, be better off. If it is combustor, if it is gasifier, no. Ash eventually will act as a bed material. So, what are the characteristics? That I have shown that there as bullet points, so there is a low operating temperature. Agglomerate. It's conical means it's not this small though. It's a real unit conical section is still this much. So if you are not allowing them the agglomerates to build up to a concrete chunk level, they will eventually they will sink at the bottom. Because they will not be fluid. Mm -hmm. Density segregation will take place, and um, so as soon as they have exceeded a size and exceeded a density uh, number, because they have grown to such a large size, they will sink. It's just like you, you, you know you take you know, uh, if you if if you cut it, put some sand, and then put your um, uh, you know the bicycle pump fluidize it from the bottom or other way around put a small duck plastic duck keep it fluidized you will see the duck gradually will go in same principle okay so the simple vanishing duck experiment very well known so um, so, the bed materials and the coal char particles etc. circulating throughout the furnace and the return leg at high velocity greater than 3 meters per second that is the CFPC regime that provides heat for drying, devolatilization, ignition of the um, incoming particles. So, that is understandable. Uh, longer precedence time for the circulating solids lower excess air relative to pulverized coal combustion and then of course staged combustion. Primary air, secondary secondary air, tertiary air, air etc. But the fact is that the efficiency of CFBC units is no more than the pulverized coal fired units um, under identical steam conditions. It's not that CFBs are more efficient, it's just that the CFBs can handle a variety of type calls, variety of calls so that uh, if a PF5 boiler is designed for lignites, that it is very large size, large volume as I showed in one of my slides. But then if you want to use bituminous calls in there, it will remain underutilized or so you have to get up that per capacity. CFBC it's not a problem. Because at any point of time, we are putting only 5% um, uh, 
combustible solids. The rest are the same. So whether that 5% comes from lignite or bituminous or anthracite, not much of a difference. Hmm? What will be a problem? I said it will not be a problem for CRBC. Palo, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, oh, sorry. I, I think I, 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 I spoke too fast. What I meant was, uh, remember in one of the slides, I showed that the high moisture lignites, the, the volume of them is very, very large. They are taller, they are bubblier. Um, uh, but so if you design a PFI unit for lignites, high moisture lignites, and then later you want to convert it from lignite firing to bituminous coal firing, the, uh, uh, its capacity will most possibly remain underutilized. It will take longer time. Uh, it will take longer time. Whether that will be sufficient. Uh, when I say that it will remain underutilized, means the, if the, the a 500 uh, megawatt unit. Uh, for bituminous, using bituminous coal, if it is of this size, 500 megawatt unit using high moisture brown coal may be this size. Because in the high moisture brown coal, you have so much water vapor whose specific volume is large, you need to accommodate that. For bituminous coal, it's not a problem. Now, all of a sudden, if you stop firing the lignite in the brown coal, high moisture brown coal here, just feed enough coal in there. The point I'm making is that this furnace will remain underutilized. You can feed more into it. Because the, all these particles, how is the combustion rate um, uh, did, uh, expressed? Combustion rate is expressed as so many grams per square meter per second. So now that you have got large square meters in the PF5 uh, lignite uh, boiler, so it will be uh, underutilized. You can increase it by putting in higher coal feed rate if you want to. And here, therefore, you can feed it for quantities of vitamins. If you, now, if you um, uh, prepare it to the same size, it will, be, it will, it will um, if something gets burnt at this length, it will definitely get burnt at that length if they are of the same size. So you and I are at the same wavelength. So we have not dis we haven't disagreed anything. Okay. Mm -hmm. In the CFB, it 
it will, if you properly design it, it will not impede because the moisture is of an incoming feed always goes out first. Then the volatiles go out in their way on their way out. Um, uh, they immediately they as uh, as quickly in milliseconds they are released. They ignite and they create the temperature in which the um, volatile free char then gets marked. So nothing is impeding. Nothing is impeding. Now I'm not saying it will. I'm not saying it will not work. I'm saying that the furnace will remain underutilized. It will still be. Uh, it will still work. But the point is, you are building a palace for only one person. The palace is capable of accepting more. Here. Yeah. No, if the ID fan is a volumetric no. equipment. So if you are generating the same volumetric flow rate, ID fan will not be over. No. Uh, so the ID fan, what it is doing is essentially um, uh, the PF fan, primary air fan, forces air from outside into the boiler. And the boiler is operated slightly under vacuum. And ID fan really facilitates from vacuum through to chimney. So there's nothing. Simple. In CFBC, there will be bed material. Oh, CFBG. So when you go to the lab to see the fluidized um, circulating uh, bed, even though it will be an atmospheric pressure, you will actually see that not everything is circulating. The bottom part is bubbling, the, the other part is circulating. And then when you go to transport reactor, everything goes. So there will be the difference. Mm, good, good. I love questions. So when you go to the lab, so you will see the example. Yeah. You'll see the you'll see the example. Oh, the uh, the moving beds and the bub uh, coalescing yeah, bubbles and all. Fuel, fuel, fuel flexibility is the largest variable, largest reason for selecting CFB. Um, and the other ones are, uh, you know, the lower temperatures, and those sort of things. But by uh, uh, fuel flexibility and the ability to handle um, the large particles, then lower NOx 
progressively in that order. But number one is pure flexibility. Oh, we'll come to that. CapEx is very um, reasonable. Otherwise, those would not have been built compared to pulverized. Pulverized is the baseline, if you like, of everything. Pulverized uh, coal-fired units are the baseline of all um, solid fuel power generation units. You compare against pulverized coal-fired units only. Uh, not necessarily cheaper, but you have to uh, uh, ask yourself the question, this is the type of fuel that I have, can I actually burn it in a PF? Because I'm looking for high milling cost. If I want to, do, uh, if I want to use it in the PF fired boiler, then I need to grind it to a very fine size. Yeah, 10 micron to, uh, not 10 micron, I mean uh, 75 to 125 micron, so 100, 100 micron mean size. But here, very large can be accommodated. PF is still the workhorse because as I showed you the figures. Uh, Supercritical PF, yeah, but yeah, after supercritical PF, yeah. Yeah, so it's PF. So PF is the baseline. PF is the baseline. CFBs are still smaller. Out of 2,000 gigawatt, you only have about 50 gigawatt of CFB. So that's what I showed in the previous slide. Yeah, those who, wherever people have very um, poor quality cones. Okay. So we'll see that in the next slide. So the, po the point that I, may, I also make uh, painstakingly is that the efficiency of the CFBC unit is the same as a PF unit if the, uh, if the steam conditions are identical. Uh, so it's not... Uh, not uh, correct to say that CFBCs are more efficient. Because the temperature, um, uh, the uh, cycle efficiency, the Rankine cycle efficiency comes from the steam, steam conditions. So whether the, uh, you generate that from a CFB or from a PF really doesn't matter. So advantages of CFB combustion, one is a lower operating temperature, around 900, relative to pulverized coal combustion. So these are the factors why CFBs are preferred. Question, the fuel flexibility, uh, uniformity of the heat flux, because everything is moving. Um, excellent load following capability, uh, which means in the night time, say, if all of a sudden the load drops, uh, you have less demand than the fluid beds, fluidized beds are brilliant for that purpose. You simply extract some bed materials and then it will drop. And then when the load picks up, you put that back in very quickly. Correct. So load following capability is a very important aspect of a coal fired unit. Uh, natural gas units is the best because this natural gas, I mean, it's a gas, gas, but um, uh, PF, compared to PF, the uh, CFBs have much better load following capability. Then the temperatures of P uh, CFBs are such that sulfur dioxide capture is... Uh, in where? What temperature the flue gas is generated in the CFB? Around 900. 
Ja, 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 Fluggas. Oh, and the exit of the cyclone? Pretty much, not much different really, because it's still very high. Because um, there are, you are not having too much of superheaters and reheaters, etc., over there. So you can get um, 800, 850 at the outlet of the cycle. Mm. Yeah, some, not much. So in the next section, so here I am just concentrating on where the bed materials are circulated. The convective section there. Efficiency of the Rankine cycle is de determined by the temperature limits. If you can have a super duper material available, then obviously it can be what so, so the point I, I have made here, efficiency of the CFBC units, I choose my words very carefully. Efficiency of the CFBC unit is similar to PF units under identical steam conditions. And steam conditions are not something like, um, they are like 550, 600, or 650, or 700, up to that. They will not be like 575, oh, I decide, okay, this has been desi designed for 600, let me put less water in and let me get 620 not to argue that way. In the CFB, in CFB carbon conversion is close to 100% because of the time. Okay. So, yeah. So the thermal efficiency is de is defined as say the temperature that you have produced minus the temperature at which the gases are going in, divided by the temperature uh, that uh, at which they are going out. So T two minus T one over T two. Um, that's thermal efficiency. What the cycle efficiency is determined only by steam conditions, right? Nothing else. So if that steam conditions is the same, then CFBC and this is nothing is the same. The only difference is that the CFBCs have, CFBCs have this distinct advantages. The boiler size is compact, not as large as uh, the uh, uh, PF. Then simplified fuel feeding, pulverization is not needed. Uh, crushing may be sufficient. Milling takes a lot of energy. So because of these advantages, this is also touted as ideal for oxyfuel based CCS. So if you can, um, um, uh, if you can recall, this is the one that I showed to you all of you before. Did I or not? Didn't, didn't. Yeah. So, um, so here, this is this fluidized bed. This is the circulating fluidized bed. This is the only bit. This is the only bit. Uh, hmm? This is the only bit that um, that uh, we were showing previously. But then you also have all the convection section, etc. Um, what happened? Battery is somewhat lost. Anyway, um, the the convection section, uh, the air preheater section, these are all over there. So there you are um, 
generating extra um, uh, steams. So, so what all I have shown is only that bit, nothing else. So all I have shown is this bit here in the previous slides. So the uh, chronology of the CFD, um, the initial operation of the CFD is a little bit recent, uh, in 1975, and then the fast generation is like this, and then gradually they have Secondary generation, uh, in second generation units have become very much compact. And, uh, and uh, you can see um, uh, the, the units which are predominantly in, uh, in, uh, in Europe uh, and also in the Europe. Most time now have um, uh, gone to larger units to in Korea and of course a substantial number has gone up in China. Um, designs up to uh, 800 megawatt is available that, that I know but nothing has been built. So let's see where is the problem uh, uh, in, a, in a CFBC plant. So, so far we have seen only this one. So then you have the convection section, then you have the ARP heater, then you have the ESP or the back filter, the dust collector. And um, as far as oxy CFB is concerned, then you can have the recirculation, recycle gas from here, right? After the particle free recycle RFG as we, as we showed in the morning. Um, so recycle. And then the mixer, as you we were talking about in the morning, and then that mixer mixed the gas, then goes together with the oxygen it is mixed, then goes to the preheater and then eventually to the main CFB. So, so that's the only difference. Now, otherwise, everything is similar to what we um, saw in the morning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Those uh, desulfurization separately will not be there because the fluidized bed, the uh, you capture the temperature is such that the thermodynamic uh, SO2 capture uh, temperature is right in the bed temperature around the 850, 900 degrees mark. Um, so what I wanted to um, uh, tell you is that um, here the potential impurities, I mean the gaseous impurities can be taken out depending on what level of gas purification system you are intending to use. Okay. Um, so the only difference between the air CFB and oxy CFB is that it is a variant of air CFB. Of course, here you have oxygen mixed with recycled flue gas, particle free recycled flue gas, and the fluidization and combustion is made by the provided by the by that mix. Uh, the bed and the gas temperatures to the same level as in an air fired CFB, so not different exactly as it is in OxyPF and ARPF. We said that maintaining the temperature is the key. Um, and, uh, but compared to PF, uh, the recycled flue gas quantity uh, is here less, simply because uh, the recirculating solids also provide a sort of temperature control because the recycled solids from here, when they fall into the external heat exchanger, they get cooled. Cooled not, doesn't mean cooled down to ambient, but at least no longer uh, there is any combustion being sustained here. So, get, so that um, controls the temperature to, to a good extent. So what I'm saying is that we are talking, we are comparing that. 
to recycle flue gas in a CFB, oxy CFB, proportion of it is less than compared to PF. Okay. So the other likely characteristics of the oxy CFB that I wrote is that the strong mixing in the furnace and long residence time due to the circulation of solids allow high carbon burnout. So even if you have a big one, big particle, it will um, eventually be con converted because it's getting more time. So this clearly suits the low reactive coals, which could be the highest coals. Recirculation of the cooled solids from the external heat exchanger allows the oxy CFB boiler to operate with lower fluid gas, fluid gas recycling compared to oxy PF system, and that's the point I have already made. Therefore, it also allows better temperature control and fluidization with high oxygen levels and um, up to 70%. Reduction of flue gas recycling, thereby reducing the size of the boiler uh, island, which means the area that is required by the boiler, and some of the auxiliary consumption. This may potentially allow more compact and less expensive CFB boilers. So here we are talking in terms of the oxy CFB boilers that potentially these ones will be more compact compared to the CFB, uh, air-fired CFB. And then, um, then the direct sulfation of limestone will occur due to the high partial pressure of CO2 and the right thermodynamic temperature for sulfur capture. Calcium conversion under direct sulfation is usually higher than that under calcination stroke sulfation due to the better porosity of the product layer. So I will revisit that later. Sorry? So in air fire CFB boiler, there is no flue gas recycling. So we have funny to uh, talking about flue gas recycling, we are talking about oxy PF versus oxy CF. Then the other advantages are that um, the fans and the blowers consume less power as the draft system handles higher molecular weight um, gas but much lower quantity. O oxygen Oxygen concentration in the recycled flue gas can be kept to a low and safe level, while additional oxygen can be introduced through oxygen nozzles separate from the burner or the secondary gas insertion points if you are using a highly non-reactive coal which will require staged oxygen. So that is possible. The most important thing is an oxy CFB just like OxyPF, you will actually start under air condition. So air CFB condition and then progressively you'll move from air CFB 21% through to whatever oxygen uh, can be, uh, you want to put in. So that transition we are talking here is potentially easier relative to OxyPF. Why? Because the CFBs have large amount of inert bed material that helps in controlling the bed temperature. In a PF, that this, uh, advantage is not there. And this is the last point is the most important point, that the CFBCs are operated at slightly over atmospheric pressure. Possibility of air in leakage is greatly reduced. In PF, what happens? So it is, there is a possibility of in leakage from out to in. Here it will be a lot less. So that's an advantage. And no, PF boilers are always operated at, uh, under slight vacuum. That's to be a reason. So what's the reason? What's the reason? You are already you are already there, almost there.
which furnace? PF. Okay. Air can also be easily supplied here. <laughs> Sorry? Correct. So you have to have a balanced draft system. First of all, the PF, uh, sorry, the PFM forces everything in, but unless, um, unless you create a huge pressure there, you won't be without any ID fan. You won't be able to force everything to go through the 50, 60 meter tall unit, and then eventually uh, overcome the pressure of the ESP and then go through the chimney and then uh, 120, 130, 180 meter chimney. So it is the, if it, the reason it is uh, done under vacuum is that there is such a short time available for combustion that you need to have them there all the time. So that's why the vacuum allows it. If it was overpressured, that would be forcing it away from the temperature zone and a lot of un unburned carbon will be created. So for those reasons, PF fire boilers are always operated under balanced draft condition. Retain the char there so that they can burn quickly within those few seconds. Where in PF boiler, not much. Not much. So the ID fan they takes everything from the from inside the furnace where the it is slight vacuum gives it enough draft to overcome the pressure drop through the chimney. Then then it will be you will be forcing the you will be forcing the particles away from the furnace they will not get the time to burn. Less, it will get more time if, he, if it is vacuum. So that's why it is always balanced draft, so that the particles spend enough time and not... So here it is not an issue. Um, so, so that's the point, that... Um, that um, it is uh, operated at slightly over atmospheric pressure, so the leakage is not an issue. The, I have showed this graph in here. The only difference that we are saying is this, um, sorry, this one, that the development of the fast oxy CFB actually started quite early, but only from 2006 onwards it started um, developing, uh, growing, the oxy CFB development. Um, so these are all air-fired CFB, and then the next bit is the oxy-fired CFB development that we are talking about. And this is the uh, major oxy CFB facility in uh, Spain, um, where they have um, two different units side by side. One is a PC boiler next to it the, and on the top. Uh, this is a demonstration plant or very, very large pilot plant. Uh, one is a PC boiler and next to it is the 15 to 30 megawatt thermal uh, CFB boiler. It's flexible, its capacity is flexible depending on wh what type of uh, fuel you are burning. The capacity can be low or capacity can be high. CFBs offer that advantage. So the, this is the first ever integrated facility. And because it's the first ever integrated facility, they built in lots of, um, uh, lots of uh, flexibility, being a development facility. And they have all sorts of other provision. On the top, if you can see, they have, they have the oxygen storage facility. Uh, they have the preheating train in here. They have the all sorts of mixtures. One back filter for the CFB, one back filter for the other unit, the PC, so that they could compare the performance of the PC unit, pulverized coal fire unit, 
versus the uh, CFB unit. Oh. No, 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 no. Inti integrated means integrated means not just this unit, but also integrated with the rest of the auxiliaries. That's what it means. Oh yes, yes. Because yeah. these are two um, separate units, uh, so they have their. You see, they have their same uh, d uh, different uh, uh, call hoppers. So one is not relying on the other. But they had could uh, they built those side by side so that they could compare the performance. Huh? Spain. Spain. Oh, yeah, all across. So, so I visited this um, um, when? Eh? No. PC boiler is actually. Uh, I'm trying to remember. Yeah, it is also uh, oxifier. Yeah, so then they built it with European Union funding and um, the Spanish utility, and um, you can find from their website what's that um, current status is. I think they have stopped all the program. They have whatever test program they wanted to run, they have run it. So it's the fuel flexibility of a unit um, that makes the capacity to vary. So if you have a low rank coal, you get less capacity. If you have a high rank coal, you can still use it. You'll get more capacity. So that's why it is so flexible. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So the, um, the Oxy CFB uh, part I am talking about here. And uh, on the box on the left, uh, they have the oxygen flow rate, 8,775 kilograms per um, hour. Of the total flue gas, they have the provision to recycle almost everything because it's a flexibly designed uh, very compact plant and um, they also have the provision to generate the steam that's how they control it but they don't have the turbine um, so, because it's a test unit so they are testing the performance of the oxy cfb section and how that then uh, interacts with the CO2 capture. Continuity of the operation. And find out where the problems are, sort them out, and then develop the technology. So running a turbine is not their um, requirement. They are much better off to... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they are, yeah, they are much better off to um, generate the steam and then sell the steam. Um, next door, there are lots of you know other companies who are prepared to take. So there are, um, in fact, gasification plants where uh, sometimes they just generate the gas and then sell it across the border. People are too, I mean, the other companies will take the gas. So this this is the um, uh, schematic, um, computer generated schematic of the Sudan boiler over there. Let's not go into it. But then there are much smaller oxy CFB capacity. One is in uh, VTT in Finland on the left, uh, which is 100 kilowatt thermal. Uh, and, um, and that that has double cyclone, secondary cyclone. Again, uh, laboratory rigs can be as flexible as, as you want so that you can test a whole lot of things. We have one in Canada on in Canmet that's about 800 kilowatt. Um, that's shown in here. Also CFB and Oxy CFB. 
So let's see. Um, let's see uh, the development issues. Uh, you know, uh, what are the development issues for OxyCMV because it's a reasonably new development. Of course, you need to know how the coal will perform in the oxygen uh, CFB condition because now, as I mentioned in the morning, now you don't have oxygen and nitrogen. You have oxygen, CO2 and water vapor, which are gasification agents. So coal quality issues is definitely one aspect that you want to learn. Um, we'll keep sufficient time for the two presenters, so don't worry. Um, and then the next one is the material issues, uh, which means uh, the gaseous environment, the flue gas uh, of different compositions, uh, uh, which how that affect the materials within the plant, uh, the pipes, uh, the, um, the internals of the uh, fluidized bed, etc. That's also is the is the development is an is a is a development issue that people looked at. So both these together then uh, supplies enough information for boiler design, CFB boiler design. So the Coal quality performance issues fits, fits into boiler design as you would expect. Uh, the material issues obviously will also fit in because the steam tubes will be dictated by that. Then from the boiler design, then you can have it, um, this uh, also um, is related to two other um, development issues. One is the blue one, uh, that is the gas cleanup and the impurity removal. And the other one is the air separation unit. This is an oxified uh, unit, so you need to supply the oxygen. So the, the boiler will need ASU, and the interaction of the, with the ASU and the amount of oxygen that is needed vis-a-vis -vis the recycled flue gas will determine the cost of the ASU operation. So that's what I have written there. And then the gas cleaning and impurity removal is also uh, um, related to the integrated operation because it's not only that you will be operating the boiler, but you'll also have to see how the gases coming from the boiler are being cleaned. So the, the integrated operation of the whole thing is very important. So you need, that's what you will learn from its operation of that particular plant, the plant that you build. And once you do that, uh, this all will feed into the overall economics, the information that you get. So that's how the, um, the um, scaling up actually happens, that you do at small scale, you know a little bit about coal quality issues, but then you gradually you build your pilot plant, and there you test all of these aspects so that you get the overall economics issues. Uh, you can calculate the overall economics, and then that will allow you to um, hopefully to scale up. But the important thing that I make is that integrated demonstration is absolutely necessary. So each of these boxes now, let's look at them. The first one is the coal quality issues, which will be mostly be related to um, related to uh, these two areas, this uh, the CFB area, but more particularly, it will be related to the heat transfer in the riser and heat transfer in the uh, down cover. Okay, so coal quality will affect that. Now, then. The, the next bit is the emissions that come from the top of the cyclone, the gaseous emissions. So that's where we are talking about. That's the region that we are talking about. Then you have um, um, operation of the boiler. It's very much dictated by the uh, operation of the ash or the agglomerate extractor. And when you take the ash from the CFB, 
you cannot say that I will also take, I will just take the ash, invariably you will lose some unburned carbon there. Um, your task will be to minimize it, but you will lose some. And then at the same time, as you do so, you can also have a good fill for the bed agglomeration problems because whatever you are extracting, if you, still, if you see chunks of agglomerates from there, the agglomerates present there, then obviously you will know that agglomeration has become an issue. Now the heat transfer means um, within that zone where you will have steam tubes there as well as in the downcomer, the external heat exchanger where you extract the heat. Um, if the coal quality, coal is uh, not of a good quality, you will have less um, steam uh, generated. Less, less moisture will be a factor in that. If the coal doesn't have much carbon in it, uh, hydrogen really doesn't matter at only 4%, then it will have less heat to transfer. So the coal quality really affects. If it is a caking coal, for example, um, uh, caking coals can be used, but that will affect the heat transfer. And then on top of that, then we have the fouling. So we talked about slagging and fouling, etc. Here we don't have slagging as such. Here we have bed agglomeration uh, replacing, uh, but fouling is still there. And fouling happens in the PFI boiler in the convection, in the second pass, um, and here it happens in the second pass. I mean, uh, in the economizer, superheater economizer section. So you can see where the superheaters and the economizers are, um, are located. But then there is also a, another phenomena which is not present in the PF because uh, the phenomena called recarbonation. Recarbonation means if you are using calcium carbonate to capture the, uh, or limestone to capture the sulfur, so calcium carbonate being, becomes calcium oxide and carbon dioxide inside the bed, inside the main riser, uh, that's calcination. So that calcium oxide then starts circulating. But then when it goes into that zone shown by the three arrows, one in the economizer and two in the downcomer, the temperatures are such that there the calcium oxide can recombine with the CO2 at those temperatures. And that phenomena is called recarbonation. And recarbonation is, is identified as a significant problem in oxy CFB. So not everything is good for everything. Every technology has its own share of problems. 